SpaceX is launching Starship Flight 12 this month. Booster 19 and Ship 39 are nearly ready, and the timeline perfectly aligns with Artemis 2's February 6 launch window. NASA just rolled back the platforms from their SLS rocket, signaling they're moving forward despite unresolved heat shield issues from Artemis 1. But here's the critical question. Which mission actually matters more for humanity's return to the moon? And why is Starship becoming the irreplaceable backbone of NASA's entire Artemis architecture? Let's dive right in. It's been nearly three months since Flight 11 lit up the sky in that unforgettable finale. We watched Starship pierce through the plasma curtain, deploy eight dummy Starlinks, then end in a spectacular double explosion as both booster and ship hit the water. That was October 2025. Since then, Starbase hasn't slept. Ship 39 was fully stacked back in November, sitting in Mega Bay 2 like a coiled spring ready to launch. But then came the Booster 18 incident, a LOX tank rupture that sent shockwaves through SpaceX's timeline. The suspected culprit? The COPV bottles, those composite overwrapped pressure vessels that regulate propellant flow. SpaceX immediately pulled every single COPV from Ship 39 for inspection. No cameras allowed, no public updates. Mega Bay 2's doors stayed sealed tight. Why the secrecy? Because when you're building the most advanced rocket in human history, every detail matters. And every detail is being watched, especially by competitors who'd love to know exactly how SpaceX solved problems that have stumped rocket engineers for decades. On January 2nd, those bay doors finally opened. Ship 39 emerged draped in scaffolding, its black ceramic heat shield gleaming under the Texas sun. What were they doing in there for two months? The answer reveals SpaceX's biggest challenge was Starship, keeping that massive vehicle intact during the 1,650 degrees Celsius inferno of re-entry. Remember Flight 5? SpaceX replaced over 18,000 tiles and added a secondary ablation layer beneath the primary shield. The result was dramatic. The vehicle survived re-entry with minimal damage. But surviving isn't enough. Ship 39 needs to prove something more ambitious, that Starship can land intact, refuel in orbit, and continue to the moon. That's where the crunch wrap comes in. It's not some fast food reference. It's a soft material wrapped around each tile to seal the microscopic gaps where superheated plasma tries to sneak through. Think of it like weather stripping on a door, except this door is traveling at Mach 25 through the upper atmosphere. Will Ship 39 survive its first flight? The engineers I've spoken with say yes, but with an important caveat. This mission isn't about perfection. It's about data collection. SpaceX is pushing the Raptor 3 engines harder, testing new raceways that organize propellant lines and electrical systems along the vehicle's exterior. Every sensor, every temperature reading, every vibration measurement feeds into the system that will eventually carry NASA's astronauts. As of today, Ship 39 is about 90% ready. The scaffolding needs to come down. Then it rolls out to the Massey site for cryogenic testing, probably this week. After that, back to Mega Bay 2 for engine installation. Six Raptor 3 engines, each one representing the cutting edge of rocket propulsion technology. Then it's off to the new test stand for static fire, where we'll finally hear those engines roar at full power. Timeline? Ship 39 should be flight ready by January 25th. Launch window opens January 30th or 31st. But here's where things get interesting. Ship 39 needs six engines. Booster 19 needs 33. On January 2nd, Starbase rolled out something that looked like Booster 19, but it was just the aft section, the business end where ship and booster connect during hot staging. They lifted it onto test tank B18.3 and subjected it to the can crusher, 
a hydraulic monster that simulates the crushing forces of 33 Raptor engines firing simultaneously. Why test just the aft section separately? Because if that connection point fails during hot staging, you don't get a successful mission. You get a fireball at 40 miles altitude. SpaceX learned this lesson the hard way during earlier flights. Now they're making absolutely certain the hardware can handle the stress before committing the full vehicle. The good news? This approach lets them validate the design quickly and make adjustments before Booster 19 ever leaves Mega Bay 1. The full booster is already stacked and waiting. Cryogenic testing happens this week, probably before Ship 39. Then comes the really complex part, installing all 33 Raptor 3 engines, each one precisely aligned, plumbed, and wired into the vehicle's control systems. And this isn't just about the booster. SpaceX is testing their brand new Pad 2 infrastructure, the flame trench, the orbital launch mount, the entire propellant farm. None of this has been proven at full scale with Raptor 3's increased thrust. If everything goes according to plan, both vehicles complete testing by January 27th. That aligns perfectly with SpaceX's FCC license, which covers January 23rd through June 28th, 2026. While SpaceX sprints toward Flight 12, NASA just hit a major milestone. On January 31st, the retractable platforms pulled away from the SLS rocket inside the vehicle assembly building. For the first time in months, Orion and its massive orange booster stood fully exposed, ready for the final countdown to Artemis II. NASA spokesperson Bethany Stevens confirmed the launch window. February 6th through April 2026, four astronauts, Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Cook, and Jeremy Hansen, will fly around the moon, reaching 7,400 kilometers beyond the lunar far side. Ten days, one spacecraft, and a heat shield that's causing serious concerns. Here's what happened during Artemis 1. Orion came screaming back through the atmosphere, and instead of the heat shield wearing down evenly like it was designed to, chunks of Avcoat material cracked and flaked off. The capsule looked like it had been through a war. That was acceptable for an uncrewed test. With humans aboard? Different story entirely. NASA ran over 100 tests and identified the root cause, gas buildup during the original re-entry trajectory. Their solution? Shorten the skip phase, reducing time and extreme heating. No replacement heat shield, just a modified flight profile and hope that the engineering calculations are correct. Is February 6th realistic? NASA says yes, but observers who've watched this program for years are more cautious. A slip to March or even April wouldn't surprise anyone. When you're putting four people on top of a rocket that's already shown troubling anomalies, caution isn't optional. Then came Jared Isaacman's comments. As NASA's new administrator and someone who's actually flown in space aboard SpaceX vehicles, Isaacman didn't pull punches. Orion is 20 years old and has never carried a crew. The heat shield issues from Artemis 1 are serious. The recent solid rocket booster test ended with an anomaly. And Boeing's quality control on the exploration upper stage? Concerning. These aren't political talking points. This is a spacecraft commander looking at hardware he might not trust his own life to. When Isaacman speaks, people listen because he's not a bureaucrat managing budgets. He's someone who understands what it means when systems fail at 17,000 miles per hour. The contradiction is becoming impossible to ignore. Former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine supports SLS while simultaneously proposing dual launch strategies to compensate for its limitations. Translation, even SLS's defenders know it can't do the job alone. And that's where Starship enters the equation. Not as a backup, not as a competitor, as the irreplaceable backbone of the entire Artemis architecture. So here's what Elon Musk discovered that NASA didn't advertise. Artemis II can launch in February, and the crew can orbit the moon successfully. But without Starship's orbital refueling data from Flight 12, Artemis III can't land. 
the moon base can't happen, the entire sustainable lunar architecture collapses. NASA needs Starship to deliver 100 to 150 tons of propellant in orbit, something the SLS physically cannot do. Flight 12 isn't just another test. It's the mission that proves whether orbital refueling actually works at scale, whether cryogenic propellants can transfer between vehicles in zero gravity, whether the connection systems can handle the thermal stress. That's the secret. America's $93 billion government program now depends on a commercial rocket that costs 100 times less per launch. The irony? SpaceX will probably launch Flight 12 before Artemis II even leaves the pad, collecting the critical data NASA desperately needs while their own rocket sits in final reviews. We're watching the future of space exploration transform in real time. The question isn't which mission matters more. It's whether we're ready to accept that the path back to the moon runs through Starbase, Texas, not Cape Canaveral. If this analysis opened your eyes to what's really happening behind the headlines, hit that like button and share this video. Drop your prediction in the comments. Will Flight 12 launch before Artemis 2? And subscribe to Space Update 24 hours because this race is just getting started. Rocket Lab just moved flight-ready hardware to the launch pad. Blue Origin is still talking about timelines. One company completed full qualification testing on revolutionary reusable tech, while the other keeps delaying its next big step. Here's what makes this shift crucial. Rocket Lab became America's second most active launch provider without billions in legacy funding or government contracts that competitors rely on. So what did they build that has aerospace analysts calling it a genuine threat to the status quo? Let's dive right in. For years, every conversation about reusability and launch cadence started and ended with SpaceX. That's changing faster than most people realize. While Blue Origin continues refining presentations about what they'll eventually do, Rocket Lab already shipped actual flight hardware to Launch Complex 3. The difference isn't subtle. Here's the context most analysts miss. Rocket Lab operates without the safety net that protects legacy companies. No massive cash reserves from a billionaire founder. No decades-old government contracts guaranteeing revenue. No institutional legacy to fall back on when development hits roadblocks. Yet they've launched more than 70 orbital missions with 16 flights this year alone. That puts them ahead of Blue Origin's entire orbital launch history. How did a company without those advantages build that kind of momentum? The answer starts with Electron, 